Uh, well, you get, the, you get the bottom line here is that the biggest adjustment in terms of the trade has been with Latin America. Uh, they represent 21% of trade, but 27% of the adjustment. So Latin America is the one part of the world that has bought more, has bought less of our exports. You know, they contracted and stopped our contracts, didn't buy our stuff more than any other part of the world. Everybody else has adjusted about uh, on par with what we would have expected. Why is that? Once again, we can look at exchange rate adjustment as being part of the story. The depreciation of the dollar, which makes US uh, exports more competitively priced, uh, has happened relatively uh, less with Latin America. OK, so that's our trade adjustment story. I want to turn now to the pace of uh, financial adjustment what's going on in the financial side of the story. So once again, I've drawn a chart that looks at the two sides of the capital account. The red line, and we start in 1980, and we go basically up to close about the present. The red line is foreign purchases of US assets. So when foreigners buy a US company, foreigners buy a US treasury security, foreigners buy stocks and bonds uh, of US companies, uh, that is a capital inflow. It's the red line. The blue line is a US purchase of a foreign asset. That means you decided you want to put some international exposure in your portfolio. So you go get an index fund that's a European fund, or it's a Pacific Tiger fund, or it's a Latin American fund, or maybe you're actually buying uh, you know, German bonds or something like that. So that is a U.S. purchase of a foreign asset. So the first observation that we can take from this chart, of course, is that foreign purchases of U.S. assets, capital inflows, are bigger than the other way around. And that, of course, is because we run a trade, a trade deficit. If we export less than we import, which, uh, well, we're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> I was going to go back, but I won't. Um, you know that we import more than we export, that we have a trade deficit, and we've had a trade de deficit for more than 25 years. Um, what we observe here is the way we pay for uh, buying more than we can afford is by selling U.S. assets, selling stocks, bonds, and other assets. So those are our IOUs. With regard to the adjustment, however, <clears throat> as I say, as I see in the say in the bottom. Almost never before, the only example is one quarter in the recession of 1990. There's only been one time before in U.S. history that foreign investors net have taken their money out of the United States. And that's what they did last year and continue to do on net, foreign investors as a group, private public, official, uh, and unofficial. So the adjustment in terms of the capital flows has been even more dramatic than the adjustment on the trade side. The blue line, uh, as I note in the text below, only very infrequently, and I can I show you, uh, you know, a couple different times in 87, 88, uh, never more than one quarter, however, have U.S. investors brought their money home. So I don't know about what you guys did with your portfolios, but the nation as a whole brought the money home. And it's never, ever happened that we've done that for more than one quarter. So the amount of collapse of international cross-border uh, capital intermediation has been dramatic. Um, as dramatic, if not more so, than the collapse in domestic financial intermediation, the, the banking system, Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns, and so forth and so on. The international collapse 
uh, cross-border financial flows is the manifestation of the domestic collapse. Okay, so what kind of stuff did the foreigners decide to uh, take back home? What, did, what was the composition of their portfolio? Well, that's what this, this diagram, which is sort of uh, complex, but I'll walk you through it. I have selected years uh, in the bars, 90, 95, 2000, uh, 2005, 6, 7, and then the quarters in the midst of the financial crisis. And the reason why I've got those uh, individual uh, bars for at five-year intervals is to give you an idea of just how significant the uh, growth in financial intermediation has been and what kinds of assets foreigners have purchased. The vertical axis is in uh, millions of dollars. So uh, as you can see, uh, $2.25 trillion is about the maximum capital inflow that the United States had in the 2006-2007 period. So we were, you know, had two and a half trillion or two and a quarter trillion dollars coming into the United States in 2006-2007. So when that went to zero, uh, which it did net in the 2008-2009 period, that's a big hit. When you take two and a half trillion dollars out of the economy, you know, that's kind of a big shock, a big financial shock. It's a bigger financial shock than just what we observed in terms of mortgage-backed securities alone. So again, let's, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. The dark red component of each bar is foreign official purchases of U.S. Treasury securities. The other red parts of the bars are um, the hash bar, the, the uh, horizontal bars, of the, the red horizontal bars. That is foreign official purchases of assets such as Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, asset-backed securities, which of course they issued with the with many people believing that they had the full faith and credit of the United States government backing them up, even though that was not supposed to be true, it was a good bet to take because, of course, it ended up being true. Um, so, uh, so let's look at those red bars. So in 2006, 2007, uh, increasing purchases of asset-backed securities issued by the government agencies, 2008, uh, even uh, more purchases of U.S. Treasury securities. What happened in the uh, height of the financial crisis? Well, all of the foreign official holders of the asset-backed securities issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they sold them after they were nationalized. What did they do with the money? they bought U.S. Treasury securities. So that circle that I've got there is that there's a composition shift in the official holder's portfolio from holding Fannie and Freddie to holding U.S. Treasury securities. The other stuff that's going on in this uh, diagram is the dark blue. The dark blue is banks. So banks lending to each other, banks kind of taking bets on derivatives and uh, credit default swaps and all that kind of stuff. A lot of stuff of bank activity happening in the run-up to the collapse. And then in the financial collapse, all the banks took their money home. A lot of foreign banking offices taking their money back home continues to be the case. Uh, the light blue, uh, not the aqua, the light blue is foreign purchases of U.S. stocks and bonds. So if you can see, a lot of foreign purchases of U.S. stocks and bonds running up to the 
peak of the stock market, 2007, but now they've sold it and they're nowhere to be seen. So no foreign purchases on the U.S. stock market these days. So if we look at the composition of these inflows in the crisis period, what we're observing here is an increasing purchase uh, and an increasing emphasis by foreign investors on only U.S. Treasury securities. The red bar is foreign official purchases and the purple bar is private investors buying US, security, U.S. Treasury securities. So the dominant feature of capital flows right now is foreign official purchases of official U.S. assets. So it's government to government. Okay, so if, um, if foreign holdings of U.S. Treasury securities is so important and so large and a dominant feature of how we are financing our external accounts, well, we might want to look at that in a little bit more depth. So the two pie charts here start to look at one thing that we might be interested in, and that is the maturity structure of foreign holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. Uh, in uh, June of 2008, <coughs> foreign holdings of U.S. Treasury securities was $2.6 trillion, um, and 85% of it was long-term. Okay, so pretty much, you know, we were locked, they were locked in to holding long-term debt. I mean, they could trade it back and forth, but long-term debt is issued with an interest rate, it's kind of out there, it's marketable. We don't have to roll that long-term debt. We, meaning the U.S. government, doesn't have to uh, roll that debt because it's not going to come to maturity. On the other hand, the 15% of short-term debt, that is less than one year, one year and less, so it's a, a treasury bill, uh, you know, 30, 60, 90 days up to a year, that has to be rolled. When it comes due, we've got to issue more to replace it. And not only do we have to issue more to replace what's maturing, but of course we know that since we're going to be, we are, running a very large fiscal budget deficit, we are issuing more bonds. So not only do we have to roll the ones that are maturing, but we have to convince somebody to buy the new stuff. So it matters what the maturity structure looks like. So as of June of last year, which is we take surveys every year, so as of, so as of September of last year, first there was $3.2 trillion outstanding of U.S. <coughs> Treasury securities held by foreigners. And in the space of 18 months, or 16 months, um, the, matu the maturity structure had shifted from 15% short term to 25% short term. That's a pretty dramatic shift towards the short end of the spectrum. And it means that we have an even greater need to be able to issue and roll these short term securities. So, let's not, um, let's not look at that one. Um, so, we're, we are increasingly <coughs> focused on uh, the issue of the maturity structure of U.S. Treasury obligations. Well, we know two facts already. We know first that most of the U.S. Treasury securities owned abroad are owned by foreign official institutions. Okay, we know that. So what, and then we know that there's been an increased share at the short end. So let's put those two facts together and ask the question, what do we know about the maturity structure of official holdings of U.S. Treasury securities? So these two charts get us headed in that direction. Um, the inset uh, chart, which is from the 1998, yeah, 1998 up to the present, and then there's a line across it, 
The line across it is 100%. And the chart is telling us what share of does Asia play in the foreign official purchases of the U.S. Treasury assets. So if you look at this chart, you'll see that the bars are, uh, you know, pretty close to 100% in the ha historical period, 1999, in fact, it was over 100%. So Asia bought, official Asia bought securities when everybody else was selling them. And you see that same pattern happening through this recession and the change in uh, capital flows internationally. The Asian official investor is not only buying, kind of keeping their own stuff, official US, tre uh, US treasuries, but they are buying more US treasuries as they are being sold by other foreigners. So there's an increasing concentration of foreign official holdings in Asia. Uh, and we can see that, again, happening with uh, the large chart. The blue here and the, the green is uh, foreign purchases of the agency securities. Okay. So up until, as the crisis was developing, the foreign official institutional investor had a really good advisor because they were buying agency securities, which of course paid better than a U.S. Treasury security. So they were buying, going long, buying more into U.S. agency securities they got out just in time and made the switch into short-term U.S. Treasury <laughs> securities. So that was a really good bet. Stay with the agency security, which earned more, and in the end was nationalized. And as a bondholder, you, made, you, you were made whole. Um, so, uh, let's go to this one. Um, so, who and why uh, are investors going short U.S. Treasury securities? Now, let's step back for a minute and think about this. I said that the maturity structure is shortening. So 25% of foreign holding of U.S. Treasury securities is now at the short end. If it's a short-term bond, we know it has to be rolled. That when it comes to maturity, we have to issue a new one. We also know that there's a huge fiscal budget deficit out there. So not only are we going to have to roll the securities that come due, we're going to have to issue new ones. So basic supply and demand tells us there's a lot of supply coming online, and we're going to have to be rolling those securities and issuing more. If you're sitting there holding a lot of the asset that has to be replaced, then you get a lot of power over what interest rate you're going to demand in order to buy that security. There's a one-way bet that interest rates go up. And the more concentrated the ownership is, the more power you have over the success of that bet. So let's look at some of the numbers. Um, I just picked up a, a couple different groups here. Uh, and in the table, we have uh, what we know about the holdings of uh, various uh, uh, countries in short-term and long-term assets. 
and uh, as of the benchmark survey in 2008. And then we can, cons can construct uh, using data uh, that's available monthly, uh, and I did it up to August last year, and we have maybe two or three more months, but this is a major exercise, so I didn't do it. So we can see how the portfolio, the maturity structure of the portfolio has changed over at least that time period. So I show you China there, where China went from having 2% um, of its total portfolio of assets short term to 17.8% of their portfolio of assets is short term. Japan went from 10% short term, 9.5, to 10.5, not a big change. The UK actually went from being 14% short term to 6.5. So if anything, they're not taking this bet. Uh, now the Cayman Islands, I put this in here because the only reason why there's any money in the Cayman Islands is in order to take a bet. Uh, there's nothing else happening there. Uh, and so it's either tax advantaged or you know somebody's taking a bet. Um, and so that first was always short term or was short term in 2008. But they've increased their bet to from 43% short term to 51% short term. The euro area, a little bit of an increase in the short term debt. And I wish I could find the Middle East oil exporters, but I couldn't get them. Um, the data didn't work quite right. Uh, some of the data were missing. But at the time last year, the Middle East oil exporters had 44% of their portfolio of assets were short term. And it probably hasn't declined a whole lot, uh, if not increased. So what do we take away? from this is that first, yes indeed, we've got some major holders, major bet takers out there that in fact there's going to be rising interest rates. You want to concentrate your holdings in short term assets so that you have the capacity to bargain, in a market sense, bargain to get higher interest rates on those US Treasury securities when they have to be rolled in the next uh, episode. Now we do know, um, we do know that, um, okay, well, let, me, let me just conclude here uh, with a couple of observations and then we can talk more about this issue in the Q&A. Uh, so let's, let me conclude with the, the trade story, the finance story, and then the policy observations. Okay, the trade story. It was a consumer-led recession, no doubt about it. Uh, but right now, the adjustment process continues to be in terms of investment goods. So it went from being consumer-led to being a business investment-led recession. That has big implications for what policy you might want to be looking at in order to get us out of this. If, in fact, we end up reviving consumer demand, which, of course, a lot of people want to have happen, that means we're going to have more imports coming in, we're going to have the trade deficit widening, which means we need to be borrowing from abroad. That is something that we need to worry about if the only thing that we have to sell to foreigners is U.S. Treasury securities. The adjustment is less via Asia than expected and more via Latin America. And as I said, a lot of that has to do with exchange rates. On the finance side, <coughs> We had unprecedented adjustment in international capital flows. Really just remarkable. Uh, what we want to know is the shortening maturity. And what we also want to know is agency securities, <coughs> Fannie and Freddie, were extremely important parts of the foreigner's portfolio of assets. Well, they're not issuing securities anymore. So one question is, what are the foreigners going to buy instead of agencies? If they buy U.S. Treasury securities, well, that means one outcome. If they buy something else, that's a different outcome. Um, we also have a rising concentration of holdings of U.S. Treasuries in Asia. And of course, that's the counterpart of the exchange rate in the trade story. So what are the policy uh, implications to comment on? <coughs> Um, should our policy support consumers or business? This is a very touchy question for politicians in particular. 
Um, as I said, consumer recession is over. The business recession is not. If we believe that business is being constrained on the credit side, why isn't the Federal Reserve buying business collateralized debt obligations instead of mortgage-backed securities? Purchasing mortgages is a very blunt approach to getting at business because you have to go through consumers, the banks, and a range of other linkages. So if the issue is credit to the business sector, mortgages is extremely blunt. What about policies for attracting capital flows? Why is it that we have a maturity structure? I've given you a story about taking a bet. Uh, but another possibility is investors are going short, taking short-term securities because they don't want to be locked into a long-term US bond at low interest rates when it's quite possible that the Federal Reserve could lose control over the money supply and end up there being an ended up being an inflationary surge, which of course makes a long-term bond with a fixed interest rate really unattractive and a bad, bad thing to do. So it could be that they're taking a bet on the rolling story, could be they're making a bet on an inflation story. What are the potential complications that come out of our uh, policy scenarios? What happens when we have a rising trade deficit at the same time as foreigners really don't want to buy our assets anymore? We've got a rising trade deficit. We've got a huge fiscal budget deficit. What happens if foreigners don't want to buy our assets anymore? That's a real problem because it implies higher interest rates and or a depreciating dollar. The implications for the economy of the mix of higher interest rates versus depreciated dollar, that mix going from all high interest rates, which would be you know, very damaging to a whole range of the econ economic discussions, versus depreciating dollar, same interest rates, depreciated dollar, well, that has very different implications for the US economy. And so that constellation between the two, where we are on that spectrum, has very big implications for what we think the economy is going to look like a couple of years from now. So I'll leave it there. We're about break time. And then we can come back and do some question and answer. Thank you.